Heather McDonald has got the juices scoop. When you're on the road, when you're on the go, Juicy Scoop is the show to know. She talks Hollywood tales, her real life Mr. Segment serial data, and serial sister. You'll be addicted and addicted fast to the number one tabloid real life podcast. Listen in, listen up. Woo woo. Heather McDonald. Juicy Scoop. Hello and welcome to Juicy Scoop. I have a great Juicy Scoop for you this Thanksgiving and maybe one that you're enjoying this after Thanksgiving or whenever, because it is a juicy conversation with Matt Murphy, one of your favorite Juicy Scoopers. He is a former prosecutor of Newport Beach, but you also know him from 2020, but best you know him from his many now appearances on Juicy Scoop. And we have a great conversation about several high profile crimes that he has some insight that nobody else knows. Um, but first, I want to talk about a lot of people have asked my opinion on this, and I've gone deep dive and I've gotten your opinions. I've gotten TikTokers' opinions, and it does interest me because it's about a comedian, one of our most popular comedians today, which is a guy named Matt Reif. He's a good looking white guy, little frat boy looking. He has, I thought it was a Southern accent. Some people say it's a black scent, which he's getting um, criticism for that, meaning he, you know, is trying to sound like a black man. I don't know. I just thought he was Southern. Um, and he had a, an admitted glow up. He's been doing comedy for 12 years. He didn't just pop off from his living room. He has been doing actual stand-up comedy for over 12 years. He was um, best known for being on Wild and Out, which is, you know, you know that show with Nick Cannon. And then he was having trouble. He wasn't even getting into like festivals or anything. And he always posted videos and one popped and it was him doing crowd work. Then he started post more and more about his crowd work and people, comedians, myself included, were very impressed with that, the way that he could do so well talking to an audience that he doesn't know and building on it and really making fresh, funny material. Some comedians are really good at that. Others don't do it as much. When I do my shows, I don't do much of it because I'm really excited to tell you guys new stories. I'm a storyteller about my life. When I go on stage, other people do more observational jokes. Some people do one-liners and some people do crowd work. Some people do it all. Okay. He gets a Netflix special. He starts selling out arenas, incredible amounts. There's podcasts where say he made 25 to 45 million last year, things like that. And, you know, he's only 28. Now he got his teeth done. The first six, I suggest always getting a few more because you can see the the ones that are not uh, veneered in the back, but he is a good looking guy. He has full lips. Those appear to be natural. The jawline is questionable. It's very easy to fill your jawline, but also guys, I'm growing, I'm raising two of them. They do start to get more chiseled as they get into their twenties and some people are late bloomers. Okay. So that is why people are like, wow, this guy's good looking. And a lot of women loved him, flocked to his show, thought he was funny. Prior to his special, he started doing some interviews and whatnot, where he's like, I know I have a big female comedy uh, fan base, but I'm not pandering to the females. My comedy is really for the guys. Keep that thought in mind. The special begins, and the overall review of the special is his crowd work is much funnier than his actual written material. I watched a solid 25 minutes of it. I did fall asleep in between. I don't really always laugh out loud at comedians because I, being a comedian, I've, I'm sort of like, oh, he's talking about that. Okay, that's slightly clever, whatever. Um, I didn't think the stand-up was great. There were some things. He did a bit about old people that I was like, that's kind of weird. You know, not really cool, but whatever. Um, and the thing that he's really getting heat for is a domestic violence joke. And the joke is basically, it starts, it's the first joke of his special. And he comes out and he's like, oh, I was in Baltimore with my buddy, with my boy. And we walked into a restaurant and the woman who greets us, the waitress, had a black guy, like an obvious black guy. And the, the his boy says, wow, I feel kind of bad that she's like the face of the restaurant. Maybe, you know, maybe they should put her in the kitchen. And, and Matt Reif's uh, punchline is, I think if she could cook, she wouldn't have a black eye. Okay, now obviously he's not, doesn't really believe that women who shouldn't, that aren't good at cooking should be beaten up. He does not believe that, I please. He's making a joke of the absurdity of how horrible domestic violence is. That's my opinion as a comedian. 
However, I do think there's certain subjects that are not really worth tackling today in 2023. I think this might be one of them. Um, so a lot of women didn't find it funny, found it triggering. But mostly, I agreed with some of the comedians I saw comment on this on social media where they're like, this isn't really an original joke. And then I remembered where I first heard something like this. And it was a female comedian friend of mine had a joke. I believe a friend of hers wrote it and then gave it to her. And I'm not saying her name. I'm just saying it's not my joke. I'm not saying her name because I don't need people to go after her, whatever. But the joke was, she comes out and she's like, no woman should ever be hit, touched, anything, no matter what the circumstances is. I, I do believe that. And everyone cheers. And she goes, but you got to ask yourself, did you gain a little weight? Did you get a little snappy? Did you spout your name, all, your, you know, did you spout your, your head off again to your man? Something to the effect of that. Now, of course, she was joking as well that, you know, but it was the surprise element of the punchline that, and I believe that spe- joke might have gone in one of her early specials, but she retired material. I had a joke earlier in my standup and it was the one joke my mom's like, I don't like that joke. I don't like it. And I'll tell it to you now. I said, so my husband, he was an altar boy and everyone goes, mm, you know, and I said, and he's upset because he was not molested. And he's like, where's my archdiocese payout? What? Was my ass not tight enough as I brought the chalice back to, you know, the altar? Where? Why wasn't I chosen? That was the joke. And my mom's like, I don't like it. And I'm like, mom, I'm saying it because not everybody was molested and you should be <laughs> happy about that. I mean, but you know what? I did stop saying it. I was like, if it's upsetting my mom, it's probably upsetting other people and I can write other stuff. I've talked about that with you guys in the past that I retire jokes, I give up jokes. I'm never like, I'm doing that joke. If it bothers people, I write another thing. So anyway, my point is, I don't think his jokes are very clever. They're not original thoughts and they're and I don't know that I, you know, we believe these stories. He's not really telling that many personal stories about his life, but whatever. So TikTok, who blew him up, starts going crazy in the last couple of days. And they're realizing that he doesn't really care about his female fans, which is stupid because female fans are the most powerful, the most loyal, they're the most coveted demographic. I'm so grateful to have them. Um, but I will say, because I'm being honest here, and I don't like this about myself, that there have been times when I've had shows and I've done a meet and greet and all my girls are coming up and they're loving me and I listen to Juicy Scoop and your stand-up was so funny. And then they're like, I dragged my husband, which I always say, don't say that you drag your husband. And then the straight man is like, you were hilarious. You were so funny. I'm so pleasantly surprised. I'm so glad it came, something like that. And I get mad because I'm actually more excited to hear that comment from a straight man than females. I'm just admitting it. I don't feel that way anymore. But there was a time where I was like really excited to get that um, adoration and that you're cool girl, you know, from straight men. That's just the way I'm just being honest. I don't like it. I'm being honest about it. So he says, I don't pander to, Matt Reif says, I don't pander to my female audience. He said this in several interviews. I'm really, guys really find my humor really funny. So, Now people are like, I think we know the real Matt Rive. I think he's a frat guy. I think this is the way he talks about his friends. I don't think he respects women. I think he's misogynistic. And maybe these, maybe men will like him better. I mean, when Louis C.K. was being attempted to being canceled for everything he did, men kept going to see him. He got a Grammy. He's selling at big area, you know, big rooms again. People are going to see him. They don't really care. I don't feel like the straight men are really the ones, you know, with you know, the torches in the streets trying to cancel people. So do I think Matt has anything to worry about? Some, maybe, but I don't know. You know, there's probably a lot of people that never even heard of him until you're driving around listening to Juicy Scoop now. And now you know that he's kind of this controversial guy. You might go watch his special now and go, I thought it was really funny. To me, it's fresh. I thought it was cool. I liked looking at his his jawline, you know, and everything. We'll see if that's real or not. I'm sure someone, I kind of was doing side-by-side photos, but whatever, that's unimportant. But of course, plastic surgery is an interest of mine. Um, He also did 
podcast where he got into the anatomy of female genitalia and what he likes and what he doesn't like down there and said some really graphic things that I'm not going to repeat here that are um, not a bash on trans women and a bash on women in general. And so people don't like that. But that's what podcasting is. It's people talking about what they talk about when they're alone with each other. That's why we like podcasting. We're listening to a conversation. And there's locker room talk on a lot of podcasts. And there's also a lot of women that will talk about men's penis size and if they were circumcised and that they were bad in bed. And they they out men all the time for their performance in the sack and the size of their penis. But pe- men aren't in the street saying those women should be canceled. How dare they talk about the size of our... So I don't really agree with either one of the conversation. I think it's gross. I don't think it's cool when you date someone and you don't like him and he hurts your feelings and you're like, and by the way, everybody, because how do we know? The only the only way we know, or you say to, I, I know someone who her friend was getting married to a wonderful guy and she told everybody at the party, oh, but he has a small penis. So don't be jealous. And you know who was jealous? The friend saying that. And who the fuck knows if it's true? And who cares? And why is it our business? I think it's really gross. I think women could do better. Um, So anyway, the final thing is he responds, Matt Reif. And he's like, anyone that's offended by my comedy, click on this link. And this was on his stories about a day and a half ago, two days ago. You click on the link and it's a website for helmets for children with special needs. So he's doubling down on I don't give a fuck. And maybe this is his goal. Maybe this is his goal to get rid of the audience that did care and did come. Maybe he really doesn't like looking out to a sea of women. I had a comedian on my show that said, I'm tired of, you know, comments from middle-aged women. Hey, some men feel like that. Some people are like, "Mm, I'd really rather have this other audience love me, not this one. I'm happy to have anybody. It means so much to me that there's all different walks of life coming to see my stand-up. I love a mother, daughter, a mother, son. I love a husband, wife. I love two husbands. I love two women, two late in life lesbians. I love it all. I try to do an act that everyone can relate to. And, you know, some people relate to it more than others, but hopefully everybody will laugh. Other comedians are different. And um, so that was the controversy that was happening. A little update on P. Diddy. Now, this just popped up. Now, this guy, this is from Rolling Stone, Hervé Pierre, that used to work for Bad Boy Records, he has just been hit with a, I believe it's a lawsuit. It's from a Jane Doe. We don't know her name, but at one time she was his assistant. And she is saying that she was groomed and sexually assaulted by him for years. And there's, of course, this is from Hollywood Unlocked, not of course, but it was Hollywood Unlocked, and there's a photo of P. Diddy with this man. Also, um, I saw on Raider Online that someone close to Cassie is coming forward and saying another part of being P. Diddy's little Barbie doll in which he did horrible things to her, he wanted to get her boobs done. She went to a plastic surgeon who is no longer with us. He's deceased because he was texting someone and he went off a cliff in Malibu and he died. Anyway, they get a boobs job and she comes home and he's like, they're too big. The next day he's sitting in the office with the, according to this friend from Raider Online, sitting in the office with the now deceased plastic surgeon. And he's like, take them out and get put smaller ones in. And she's crying and she's not speaking for herself. And he's like, the surgeon's like, no, 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 wait, there's a lot of swelling. It'll go down and it's not good to do surgery so close to each other. She went along with it. I assume she had to sign even though she was crying and never spoke. And then he put her under a week later to replace the boobs to the size that P. Diddy wanted. There is a photo of her out with her daughter, Cassie. I hope she has a beautiful um, Thanksgiving. I love that she has shared her stories, I that people are coming out, that she wasn't silenced even though people are like, shut up, move on. You were you know, with him for these. I totally believe everything this woman said and I think this is a perfect scenario for her. She got her story out. She got her money and she doesn't have to be dragged through a court thing for years to come. But that is why I speak out and I have anytime someone has said lies about me or whatever, I speak out and I share because I'm not going to be silenced. I'm not going to keep the secrets of the people that treated me horribly. And that has been my, you know, MO since I started this podcast eight and a half years ago. So 
Anyway, we have a juicy one. Uh, I also want to tell you guys, if you're part of Patreon, there'll be not only a Friday Patreon, there is going to be the Get Me Behind Gates Patreon that I've been promising you guys. I just wanted to have all the information, which I now do for a real juicy one. I'm going to be doing a true crime with Shannon, a juicy crime since she's here. That's all going to be dropped over the weekend while you're cleaning or walking or, you know, doing shopping. Speaking of shopping, all of the HeatherMcDonald.net merch will be available with a discount. And we're going to give that discount on our Patreon. So if you want to get anything for anyone you love, that's what you do. And now for a juicy one with Matt Murphy. We've got the juicy crimes expert here, Matt Murphy. Welcome back. We have so many juicy crimes to discuss. So much. Um, first of all, the most important question for the juicy scoopers, what is going on? Are you still single? Uh, yeah, I'm still single. Um, got a place. <laughs> yeah. The disaster that is my love life continues unabated. Um, uh, I've got a place in New York City, so I'm splitting time right now. I'm doing a bunch of media out there. Okay. Uh, I've been working on a book. People uh, know you best, I think, from 2020. You're a regular on 2020, right? right? So, okay. So, yeah, I work for ABC News in New York City. Uh, they just had the season premiere for 2020. They went head-to-head -head against Dateline on the same story. and they, What story was that? Um, that was uh, this uh, case out of Austin. Um, oh, so... Let's talk about that. But oh, first, no. before different, we, different a case. different case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, c c tell me the case out of Austin. That so you're this saying. is one where um, it is. It, it's an old plot line. Um, it's this woman that manipulated the Green Beret, the former special soldier, special forces soldier, into murdering her husband, and it's actually tragic. And this is one where I, after 17 years in homicide, I've I finished working on that story, feeling kind of sorry for the guy, for the for the Slayer. Okay, now I know the story. Yeah. yeah, it's awful. It's awful. This woman is uh, she. So basically, she wanted she wanted life insurance money, mm -hmm. um, the oldest motive in the world, right? And she winds up randomly getting hit up or hitting up her high school flame, who had six combat tours, got blown up once, so he had a traumatic brain injury, certainly affected his reasoning, and then did the old you know the plot to body heat where she. Convince him she's being sexually abused by her horrible husband. Which is and such a common... Th th it, it is. It is. That is the storyline for it all. Body heat, for those and who finding, haven't watched like, it. And finding like a guy gullible n enough and an, into you enough to believe it. And, and then be enough. that protector. Yeah. So for those who haven't seen Body Heat, William Hurt, Kathleen Turner, awesome movie. Uh, Mickey Rourke is in it too. And wasn't it a... Um, a redo of another old yeah, that's movie. That's right. That's exactly right. Yeah. It's an old redone noir. And that is uh, basically the same plot line to the case we talked about in Newport. Uh, the yes. The Laughlin murder. Yeah. Getting your so, boyfriend to kill your husband. Yeah. Only what's different about those those two cases and the noir um, is that the women in, the, in those cases were all stunningly beautiful. And so mm -hmm. at least you could sort of see it. This one in Texas, she is... Uh, she is horrible in every way. And she, like, you wouldn't, you, you wouldn't kill somebody... Um, uh, based on superficial aspects of her personality alone. She's not that smart. She's not pretty. And she winds up convincing this guy to kill her husband. And it is awful in every way. So, Wow. Okay. So that, so you're doing that. You, so you have a place in New York. Place in New York. Yep. Um, and, um, and then you still have your place here in LA. Yeah. Still or, have a law practice here in okay. LA. Uh, yeah. And so what's going on? So you haven't found anyone that you like? Um, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I actually very recently have, um, I met met somebody, uh, but I've only gone out a couple dates sort of thing. So we'll, we'll see. But now I'm- Is I'm, she a uh, juicy scooper? You know, she's, she is not, but you know who's become a juicy scooper? Me. <laughs> I have become, since we did that interview in Newport, was that last summer or two yeah, summers last, ago? Yeah, it would have been not this past summer, but the one before. Okay, yeah. right. Um, I've I've watched this. I, this is wildly entertaining to me. Thank like, you. I'm glad about, I can, from all the, all the horror that is your job, I'm glad you can like laugh. No, the Jada Pinkett Smith stuff, we were just talking about this. I am so, like you, you express exactly what I'm thinking. <laughs> so that tends to bring you back. Like you'll say things on some of this Hollywood stuff that- uh, it's, it's super entertaining to me. So, and you anyway. were also saying before we get into some of the cases I want to cover that you are you have a book deal, right? You've so you've already done it, and now they're editing it, or you're still writing? No, it? No, the manuscript's done. Okay, we, we turned it in on time, September first, and now it's with the editor, who's uh, 
I'm actually really excited to work with this guy. He's he normally edits for National Geographic, and he's he's the man. So I, I if he can make me sound smart, um, I'm all for it. So it's did a did you enjoy the process of writing it? Yeah. Uh, so what I would do is I I got this place in New York with the idea. I saw this interview with a guy named Ryan Holiday who wrote a bunch of books on stoicism randomly, and and they said, what would you what is your recommendation to a new author? And he said. Number one, move to a city you don't live. And number two, um, don't tell anybody what you're doing. So I've already blown number two. But the move to a city you don't live. I, New York is dynamic and it's fun. And not being in a committed relationship right now, it's uh, it's an amazing place. I'm from here. And so you found him like a nice place with like sunlight coming in the window and just got your fingers typing or like nicer, what? Yeah, nicer than I deserve. And exactly did you right. feel like you were living like a movie? I like I'm a writer now? I walked into this place yeah. and I was like, this is where I want to do it. It's right on Park <laughs> Avenue. It's got a view of, of Park Avenue. Awesome. Um, and so I, I'm super close to Central Park. So my, my morning that. routine is get up in the morning, get coffee at this place called St. Ambrose, right, right across the street. Okay. Walk to the park, find a bench and then write until my butt hurt and then walk around the park, find You'd another write bench. write on your laptop or right what? on my laptop. Okay. Yep. And then, uh, and then back, and that was my routine for most of the summer. And before I knew it, we had 10 chapters, 100,000 words. And uh, yeah, and I, I hope people like it. It's kind of a mix of, um, it's, a, it's a memoir. It's a mix of uh, sort of my personal experiences, stony personal thoughts going to murder scenes, and then some of the bigger cases that I did over the years. So Awesome. Well, let's get your opinion on some of these hot ones. So this is a story of Caitlin Armstrong. Remind everybody, because I was like, wait, this is the girl that got jealous of an ex-boyfriend's new girlfriend. It involved bicycles. What is the story behind this? This is, uh, it's fabulously awesome is what this is uh, and, and tragic at the same time. So there's this it's essentially a love triangle. Um, it is this sort of famous but fading cyclist who's hitting his mid-30s and starting to go downhill a little bit. And he's in the off-road biking thing. His last name's uh, Strickland, I think his name is. Mm -hmm. And um, he's he's sort of a fading star. And he's he's got this girlfriend who he lives with. They started a business refurbishing uh, trailers, like camping trailer yeah. type things. And then he winds up meeting the young, up-and-coming, beautiful 25-year-old off-road biking star from San Francisco and they have a they have an, a, an affair he says he's broken up with uh, Caitlin. his girlfriend uh -huh. yeah Caitlin Armstrong and um, and she loses her ever loving Caitlin mind loses Caitlin it. does and winds up and you know uh, for a lot of people when they commit a murder it's their first rodeo so it's like when we do anything for the first time we suck at it and she made pretty much every mistake that you could possibly make in the So what did murder. she do how did she kill First her? of all she drove her own car um to to go and kill this poor young woman who's staying with a friend so she goes in um she uses a firearm that her boyfriend purchased for her um but the, the, wait the the cyclist boyfriend the cyclist boyfriend this is Austin Texas so okay, he bought her a gun bought her a gun okay um she used that gun uh, it's a semi-automatic Sig Sauer. So what that does forensically, and some of the true crime fans will, will know this, they eject shell casings. And shell casings are as unique as fingerprints when it comes to firearms. So there's a thing called the Niven system. And all they do, they look microscopically at the lands and grooves, and they can match expended shell casings left at a crime scene if they can recover the gun that fired them. And guess what? They recovered the gun in the place that she lived with her boyfriend. And so... So they were living together, but at one point, he's like, we were on a break. But, yeah. And he, you know, has a little with this girl. But was he currently still seeing her at the time of the murder? So this is one of those things. He's He has turned out, like, for people that have followed the story, he doesn't come off looking very good mm -hmm. because it looks like he's kind of hedging his bets in the view of some. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that, but yeah, um, but yeah, he's uh, he's got. There's some text messages that have gone public between him and the 25 year old professional cyclist, um, where she's basically saying, "Hey, I'm a little bit confused, super awkward," because it's one of those things where it gets so bad. She's confronted a couple times by uh, by Caitlin Armstrong. Oh, so she knew yeah. that this chick was after, and so right. she's writing him like. Are you broken up or what the hell? Right, and he's oh, okay. and he's come out and said, you know, hey, we we got back together. You know, it was I was on a break. It was all legit. But you read some of those text messages, and it's he was not didn't didn't appear he's entirely clear with the twenty five year old. She comes out to Austin to stay with a friend to do some some professional race, and that's when she's murdered. And and how is she murdered? Did she walk out the? She was in her friend's apartment. Okay, um, and. Uh, 
Caitlin Armstrong drives her own vehicle and they're, they're all in the bike circuit, right? So they've got, it's a, uh, it's a very distinct black Jeep Cherokee with these specialized bike racks mm. on the back and on the top, which, and there's probably a couple of cars in all of Austin that fit that. So drives her own car. It's everything but the license plate. She's driving around for a while right before the murder. Um, you know, and she was the, the guy went out with the 25 year old victim, took her to, a, to this outdoor swimming thing. They had a couple drinks and dropped her off right before she was murdered. So she comes in, the friend she's staying with was gone and the victim gets shot and is found in the bathroom. And there's a- So Caitlin went into the house. Right. And we don't know, do we know if she like knocked on the door and they had a conversation or did she just burst in an unlocked door and it, find her? We think we think the door was, well, they think the door was unlocked because mm -hmm. she had a lock with a, like a, it's an electronic lock. So mm -hmm. with a code. All right. So we know exactly when, um, when the victim got home and then shortly thereafter, there's gunshots, her friend finds her, and then there's this gut-wrenching 911 where her friend is giving uh, CPR and it got very graphic. She's, cause she was shot once in the chest and twice in the head. And with, um, with ammunition that's designed to fragment. So as she's giving CPR, she's, I, I don't know if I can say this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, on the 911 type, she's like, and she's absolutely distraught. She's trying to save her friend. She's like, but her brains are coming out as, oh. I'm, as I'm giving chest compressions. It is horrific, which is also like, you know, um, the the actual visceral horror of of what people look like when they've actually been murdered is something that most people think that we never get to see. But it's it also it's a reminder of just how awful you know yeah. this, this was. So and then she runs for it. She flees to Costa Rica. Okay, has a nose job. Tries to change her appearance. Um, again, not super smart. Starts working at a youth hostel. So she's out encountering Americans everywhere. And Costa Rica is a horrible place to disappear because the Costa Rican judiciary actually is somewhat functional and the cops will catch and extradite people. The U.S. Marshal's Office has a really good relationship with them. Like, There's a lot of places, surprisingly, in Latin America that are very extradition friendly, including Mexico. Um, where, but, where, where is a good place to go? That would that you have a better chance as of... I as I as I tip off all the murders where to flee to. No, I, I'm just no, curious, I don't mind like, doing it because life in these that... places are, would suck so bad that. But it like, might... where is a place that I'll would be you, a harder I'll chance? I'll give you three: Cuba, okay. Venezuela, and Iran. Those are all places that are never going to extradite the United States. Which was, of course, um, my Nayiri case. Uh, I don't know if we've ever talked about that. It's so my last trial. We he was a, a citizen of Iran, and we lured him out. We lured him to the Czech Republic and basically threw a net on him and extradited him. And back. what was his crime again? He kidnapped a marijuana dispensary owner, uh, took him out into the into the desert, and when he didn't get the money that he thought was buried out there, he cut off his penis. <gasps> yeah. And the guy lived. And he lived. Yes, it's horrific. That's the case I just presented on at CrimeCon. And, okay. So, uh, so okay. F wait, first, I want to talk about CrimeCon, but let's finish this. So, what has happened to her now? She escaped. Um, so they found her in, in Costa Rica. They found they, her in Costa Rica. Okay. Um, so, and, and she was only there for, I think it was 42 days before they caught her. Okay. Which is like, that's like tomorrow in, as far as international extraditions go. Uh -huh. I and mean, that's instantaneous. Um, uh, they extradite her. They bring her back to Texas. And then they were, her trial was scheduled to begin in like a week. And they take her to this medical appointment. And there's this Benny Hill scene that a lot of people have, have, have seen on video where she is in handcuffs running from this from the police she somehow got away and they're chasing her around this parking lot and like this police officer keeps falling down as they're like I, I feel kind of bad for that cop um it just kept falling over and over like and this and this woman is she's like a semi-professional cyclist she's in awesome shape and she's like running around this tree tries to climb a fence with her arms behind her back which doesn't work very well and um, they eventually caught her and uh that's totally admissible against her so is that something that happens like you have to go to a medical appointment. Like, what what kind of medical appointment cannot wait? Yeah, well, when you're like a thing. healthy woman, They're like, oh, I have a toothache or something. Yeah. I'm like, what the hell They're is it? They're required to provide medical care, and most any sort of like specialized medical treatment is always off campus. It's always outside of the jail. Yeah. It's always at some facility. So they do that routinely. But for a woman that's already fled, it's like they're getting a lot of heat right now, probably justifiable. She should have been in uh, in ankle chains or something because she's already, she's already made a runner. But they did catch her. She's back in custody now and she's fundamentally, I think I can say that she's an idiot because everything she could do to get caught, she did. She's being tried in Texas. 
a Texas jury is going to do her and she's going to she's going to eat first degree murder with a gun. And uh, that'll be that for her. Um, where is the boyfriend? Will he be part of the trial? I'm sure. He's, right. Yeah, he'll be part of the trial. He's he's basically been in damage control ever since. So he did, all the sponsors dropped him, I think, except for Red Bull. But he had a bunch of sponsors and he was he was doing it as a profession. Wow. And uh, so they've all they've all run from him. And um yeah, I don't know. It's uh, so she had confronted the victim, like on the street, or called her, or called what? Her. Yeah, oh. called her, and uh, and and there's witnesses to that, and and then um, and Ben like said what? Like stay and, away and from said, my man. Yeah, stay away from my man. Words okay. that effect. And then she's with the guy, and she's like, I just had the weirdest phone call, and he's like, Oh, I'm really embarrassed. That's my ex girlfriend. She's so the, a psycho. The, yeah, the, which is true. The victim. The is one time a guy says a girl is the ex girlfriend's a psycho. That he was telling the truth. Right, right. And, yeah. and X, not really X anymore right. type thing. And the victim was totally innocent in that. Completely innocent. Oh, yeah, totally. And, yeah, totally innocent. So, uh, yeah. But so, justice, um, justice will be done on that. She's going to. Before we get to the next case, tell us about how you went to crime con and we're scared that I'm scared that you won't be your humble self anymore. Oh, my God. No, trust me. Um uh, so CrimeCon is absolutely surreal. Come a little closer. Uh, CrimeCon yeah. is surreal. CrimeCon is- Is this the first time you've been? No, it's my, my third time to CrimeCon, but this is the first time, um, well, it's the second time I presented myself. So I went once with ABC News okay. uh, in 2019, right before COVID, and that was a blast. So it's- Where was that? That was in New Orleans. First time I'd ever been. Oh, and, okay. Yeah. And when it was in Nashville, I think the year before, um, Keith Morrison. Yep. And- Josh Mankiewicz yep. came to my stand-up show after they'd been at yeah. CrimeCon all day. So ABC will be mad at me for saying this, yeah. but they're two of the nicest guys. They're they're <laughs> they're the, like the enemy and like the you know the the head-to-head -head true crime stuff. Josh was at this last one. I I love both those guys. I know they're, yeah. they're everybody's as nice in real life as they seem to be on TV. So, Great. Yeah. Okay. So this where was this one held? So this was in Orlando, Florida, another okay. place I'd never been. Uh -huh. um, and and it's it's this Marriott. Uh, Marriott World, Orlando World Marriott, something like that is probably the biggest building I've ever been in. It was like the Pentagon with endless hallways that just go forever. These massive rooms and it's it, oh, they do big national conventions. That's kind of their their gig. And I got a room to talk about Ni my Nairi case, the Hussein Nairi, that one that I told you about, yeah. the, the guy we lured out of Iran. And I figured, you know, a few hundred people might show up for my little horse and pony show. And there was 3,200 people in the room. And it's a great crowd. Everybody's super nice. But it's this kind of weird mix of um, true crime. Um, what's the word? Uh, fanatics or? I, fanatics is too strong because they're all, they're not crazy enough for right. fanatics. They're too nice. Um, yeah. And then the uh, a lot of industry, I don't even know if that's the right word, but like podcasters. Yeah. And, and like Dateline will show up. Uh, uh, 48 Hours will show up. So it'll be kind of people that, that are in the business of true right. crime. And then they'll also have they'll prosecutors to talk about cases. Like I did a panel with uh, Camille Vasquez, who's a former yes. student of mine who cross-examined Amber Heard. She was a student of yours? I coached her for three years in high school mock trial, believe it or not. And, um, and it, Wait a minute, what high school was she at? She was at Cornelia Connolly in Orange County. Oh my God, amazing. So yeah, me, her teacher was married to a buddy of mine who was- Were a, you on mock trial in high school? At Loyola? Uh, no, they didn't have it back then. Um, at least I don't think so. It's Constitutional Rights Foundation. They need coaches. So you know, I, my, got, I got my, my sister's an attorney. I just want to say, and she did not make the mock trial team in high school. Oh, that's awesome! And it was like the one male teacher. And whenever when I saw him, I'm like, you know, my sister's an attorney now, and you didn't. And he said, "Do you know that every girl that has come up to me that became an attorney?" That I did not allow them to be didn't on mock the trial. Yeah. So he's like, so I actually think I did more for those women. <laughs> by motivating them? Yeah, by motivating them. Okay, so continue. You're, you're coaching her. So yeah. basically, Jane Jane Munoz is the teacher's name. She's married to Ed Munoz, who's a buddy of mine from the homicide unit. Okay. So she's one of those women that I've, I've learned I just need to do what she tells me to do. Okay. You know? So she's like, okay, you're going to coach my team. So me, a buddy of mine, Brian Gerowitz, another friend, Ed Flores, we wound up coaching her team for four years. Camille was on it for three. In high school. In high school. And, and did then, you think she had a lot of talent as an attorney back I, then? I did. Okay. Yeah. She was she was so into it, wanted to be a lawyer, nicest kid, and has grown up to be the nicest woman. And Camille Vasquez is the real deal. Like for those of you who didn't 
Or for, yeah, well, I don't know we if you co- watched cover- No, we covered it a lot on this show. Awesome, and she right? did a great She did a great jo- job. Yeah. yeah. So I got to watch that, like talk about a fanboy, like yeah. watching that. And I got I did some commentary for Good Morning America on that case. Mm-hmm. And, it, it, you know, I think it was Thomas Jefferson who said the single greatest um, method of attaining truth or barometer of truth is the art of cross-examination. It's like a famous old quote that you learn in law school. Yeah. And that's an example of that. Like she she owned Amber Heard and yeah. kind of um, saved a guy's reputation, I think, from their perspective. Yeah, that was, I mean, that was an amazing. Yeah. I talked, a, I mean, I talked a lot about it, but I still was sort of shocked that by doing this open op letter or whatever that she did that it led to that right you know yeah. what i mean i ca- i was a little bit like wait a minute you Me know too. about first amendment and all that and i was like this is her perspective and she didn't s-. so that's where i was i was probably the only one talking about that aspect of it like yeah. i'm like look like she's you know not a good wife and all this stuff but he was also an awful husband yeah. Ter- terrible and, toxic relationship yeah but he, uh, from Camille's perspective, she's like, yep, terrible toxic relationship, but he never sexually assaulted her. Right. He never physically abused her. And that was like, that was, that was yeah. the allegations that, you know, you can be, you can be accused of being a bad husband, bad boyfriend, yeah. but, and not get canceled. But mm-hmm. once, once allegations of sexual assault, which they made in spades against him. Yes. And like, and that, that's a tricky thing too, because, you know, I'm huge advocate of victims' rights. I did sexual assault before I um, went to homicide. Uh, I do pro bono work for rape victims. Um, but it's the one that makes the false claim is what makes it difficult on the real victims. Totally. That come forward. Right. And, and that is an important thing to point out. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. And she, at the end of that relationship, she made allegations that got him completely canceled. And now he's like, I think he's negotiating or back with disney or something i think he's and he back doing the disney and, he's yeah. got and, she, and that was the other stuff about how she mean she was about like what who'd want you you old oh, fat man and all this stuff and then now you know now he has the sponsorship for the cologne and all this other stuff that yeah. he's still it's great and so that yeah. was just but that was like a a part of history with like all the fans of Scyther, the Edward Scytherhand people and the pirates outside. I mean, there was, that was like a glorious time. Right. And then Camille's walking out and they had a gag order and, you know, part of the technique, and this is, this is kind of trial 101, but you want to, somebody that's, a man that's been accused of abuse, you want the most diminutive, petite, pretty young woman sitting next to him because it demonstrates to the jury, look, he's not a monster, right? And right. so Camille was like kind of thrust into that position. And um, I don't think anybody knew what was coming cross-examination wise. I did. But um, but by getting to to do that, um, but then the rumor started like, oh, look at her. She's, look at I how think close I she is. St- I kind of started the rumor. <laughs> I really kind of did because he was so like, but he's just sort of a gentleman and other people attest to like, no, I worked with him and he is that guy that's, you know, puts his hand on someone's back and yep. you go first and that it kind got, of thing. It got physically touchy, yeah, but that's, it, that's a tactic. That's a trial tactic. And oh, really? Yeah, yeah, big time. So they big plan time. that out? Um. Probably. Yeah. I mean, yeah. You you want the jury to see that um, because it demonstrates that he's not a danger, right? It's a, it's a very primal communication and a jury does not miss a thing. I mean, they like you, whatever you do in front of a jury, they're, they're, they're watching it. You know, I've done 132 jury trials and they didn't, it's 24 eyeballs watching everything you do. And so that was, yeah. And, and so, and certainly it, it he is that guy. He is like physically very touchy. And by not recoiling and not keeping it, you know, um, at arm's length. I was, I was glad that she didn't go on to like stop doing real trials and become like a TV personality. Yeah. No, she's, she's I'm a real, glad she went. I mean, maybe, maybe in 10 years do that. But I'm like, I want to see her like win some other really important right. cases. Yeah. You and know? she is the most humble, nicest person. Kind of like Keith and, and Josh. Like. The real life Camille Vasquez yeah. is as nice as you can possibly imagine. She's amazing. That's so, awesome. Yeah. Um, all right. I want to ask you about Tupac. What is the deal? Yeah. Explain. Okay. So here's here's one of the things that I think is fascinating about this. All right. Okay. Like, number one, this is second to the maybe the Kennedy assassination as far as conspiracies go and books have been written. There was a lawsuit on these elaborate multi-part things that 
were fascinating. And, and this is like East Coast, West Coast. You got Bad Boy Records. You've got the diss songs that, you know, that, that Tupac made famous. Um, I don't know if you ever listened but, to the lyrics of Hit Em Up, but I, I used to have this on my playlist. I, I, was in a, I was in the Orange County Gang Unit when this murder happened in 96. And can you just explain for the people that are like sure. confused because there's the Biggie murder. Right. And then there was a Tupac, right. which took place Right. In the streets of Las Vegas, right? right? So in Vegas, a uh, bunch of guys went out to a Mike Tyson fight, and he was with a guy named Suge Knight, who was the CEO of Death Row Records, and a thug, okay? A documented gangster, the real deal. Like back when like gangster rap was the thing, and, and that was, it was so glorified. And this is when the Compton mayor was coming out, calling himself, I'm the gangster mayor. And I think he wound up going to prison too, if I'm not mistaken. But, oh my God. But um so he is uh, on the strip. He'd been shot multiple times before. Tupac had. Tupac had uh -huh. and survived. And so had Suge Knight. And they're on the strip and a car pulls up next to him. It's a white Mercedes And Suge and T Tupac are in the same car. The, Suge is driving. Tupac is in the passenger seat. Okay. And the car gets lit up with gun gunfire. And I, c I can't remember how many times uh, each was hit. They're both struck multiple times. And uh, Tupac lived for six days and then died. So then not long after um, Biggie Smalls was out in Los Angeles at a record event. Um, oh gosh, I'm forgetting the name of it. It's the, uh, they have the, it's an auto museum in like near, near the Miracle Mile yeah, near downtown, yeah. right? I know and exactly. he gets shot in a drive-by and killed. So there's been these, all these conspiracy theories about involvement of the LAPD and um, all these, all this wild stuff. What it turned out to be with Tupac Shakur, Shakur, he got in a fight at the casino about 15 minutes before where they beat up a guy um, that was associated with a rival gang in LA and they beat him up because he stole a freaking gold chain at um, Little Lakewood Mall and it, they happened to run into him on the strip. It was, it with all the conspiracy theories, it was a totally banal, stupid, run-of-the-mill gang murder. And w when one of the things that's also interesting to me so wait hold on so uh, okay so tupac and and suge see this guy that stole a gold chain at yes. the lakewood mall yes and give him some shit physically no, they, beat, they beat him up yeah it's on video and there's a famous video inside a casino inside a casino i think it's the mgm grand after this mike Tyson and then fight. they leave they're like screw they you leave. dude they get in the car the guy that was beat up that stole the gold chain at the Lakewood Mall off of somebody or like at a gro at a, a jewelry either, store? It was either, the allegation was either he did it or a gang associate of his did it, but it was all over the stupid chain. It was, this is like nothing. It's, and so then that guy gets in the car and shoots them all up. That guy and then happens to run into them and he's in a car with four four men, including uh, this guy, uh, Keefe D or whatever his name is, the guy that just yeah. got arrested. So of the two cars, there's six young men, Okay. And you've got one of them is the CEO of a super successful record label. One is Tupac Shakur, who's one of the most famous yeah. musical talents in American history. And then you've got four other young men in the car. Of all of them, every single one of them is either dead or in prison today. So you talk about like the gangster rap lifestyle and the glorification of all that. And th the first chapter in my book, I get rid of gang murders right away because Gang murders are friggin' boring. It is over stuff that normal people could never understand. It's like disrespect. So it had nothing to do with Puffy or um, P. Diddy. Because that was what was no, going on in the news had, in the last couple had, of weeks. It had, it, it had well, that's nothing good. to do with him. And I, I mean, I I think that in I, I think they'll prove that, but it, it you know, and the, the thing is the guy that was arrested, one of the interesting things about the case is that he um He's made a series of public statements where he says he handed the gun back to the guy who shot. So there's a firearm in the, in the car. Um, they run into him. Hey, that's the guy that just tuned me up. Here you go. Take care of business. That's aiding and abetting. That's co-conspirator. That action that he's admitted to multiple times, once with a lawyer sitting next to him for an interview, I think it was with BET, which is an absolute head scratcher. That's, that's a full on aiding and abetting. The problem is with the reason why there was never a prosecution in it. And there's a great quote from the, one of the investigators on the Biggie Smalls murder. He said, we have the, the Tupac murder has always been solved. It, it was never unsolved. It's always been unprosecuted. That was the line, which I thought was great. So they always knew that this guy did it, um, but they couldn't get anybody to actually pull the trigger and get an indictment. And one of the reasons for that is because gang culture, they have this like silence until death omerta rule of the street thing so suge knight the guy who was also shot 
who's now in prison for, I think he, they finally pled him to a voluntary manslaughter because at, on the set of, uh, um, gosh, the um, Straight Outta Compton movie, yeah. he ran over a guy, actually two guys, killing one. So now he's back in prison. He's been in and out of prison. He's, you know, Wait, he was out of prison when they were filming Straight Outta Compton just a few years ago? Yes. And then he ran over a guy. Now he's he won't be eligible for parole for like because of all his strikes and other crimes. Um, for, I think for at least another 10 or 11 years. So all of these guys. So You think you'd get out and be like a total Boy Scout, right? Yeah. You would think, unless and thug life, whatever. So he, yeah. he refused to talk. Then he's been he's been giving interviews from jail going, oh, well, you know, this happened, that happened, but I ain't saying nothing, you know. And um, so, and they, they certainly f- didn't file it with any expectation that he would testify. So they don't they don't. So the kid it. that actually shot the gun with he's the gold dead. chain, he's already been dead for how long? Years. And and that's another thing. Okay. When you go down, so there's this this famous video of Tupac and Suge Knight beating up this guy. And there's there's got to be 15 or 20 guys like in their entourage behind them, kind of all sort of mobbing up on the guy that yeah. they got beat up. And as they go through the list of names, like of the car that they shot from, three out of the three out of the four guys in the in the shooter car are dead. This the the le- fi- final survivor just um, he's the one that got arrested. Um, Tupac is dead. Suge Knight, Suge Knight has been in um, uh, in prison four years and and will be for years. Like every so there's this this gangster lifestyle and it went it was a dead end for all these guys. And in the entourage, name after name of like witnesses that uh, that saw it. It, you know, killed in a drive-by three months after this, killed in an unrelated drive-by six months later. They're all dead or in prison. There's so it's 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 fascinating. It's like where did I mean we're talking mid, about mid '90s? Where did the gangster lifestyle lead? And it went nowhere for all these guys. All dead or serving life in prison. And I wow. I, I think that's fascinating. You know yeah. where it went. And it, it, it and this thing was just as dumb and mindless as every other gang murder. So. Right. I mean, this should be the lesson to any kid that's right. like glorifying yeah. it this. It turns out, yeah. It's all right. Really let's dumb. talk. What is the latest going on with the Idaho murder? I saw the latest thing was, you know, now they're saying the victims were awake, were texting each other. And so let me just, so remind to remind people yes, these, the four, these are the four kids that were slaughtered right. in at Idaho. And they have the guy, um, you know, getting ready for trial. When this was all going down, I was at a party with someone whose kid went to Idaho. And this is before everyone's like, what, what is going on? Who, who This is before they caught him. Nobody knew what happened, why the girl wasn't, how did they not hear it, all that kind of stuff. And... The story that was told to me didn't match up, but now it is. The story that was told to me, which I was told, do not say anything, Heather, don't say anything on Juicy Scoop. This is an active investigation, which I did not, you know, which is, I want people to know, (laughs) I mean, my God, was that one or both of them were hiding under their bed, under the bed, and was texting each other. And then, the, and then when it all came out, I was like, well, I don't know if that's true. So what do we know right now? Well, so yeah, those rumors are out there, but I don't think that information has been released in any sort of court document yet. So I, I don't think that's official. And the problem is, is that the case has had so much media. Right. We, everything you kind of got to take with a grain of salt unless it's in a search warrant or unless it comes out in a, in, a, in a court document. The court, because the media attention has thrown a gag order over the whole thing, and so nobody can really talk. Um, but I can tell you this: this the the nuts and bolts of this are fascinating. Um, so this is it, it. First of all, it is horrific. Um, you you've got four innocent kids, and this is uh, this is an American psychopath. You know, yeah. This is a guy. He's he is obsessed with at least one of them. I think he shows up there, and I and I love all the different conspiracy theories. Like, oh, wait a second. You know, um, one of them was that the. Uh, and I think the defense actually sort of prompted this in one of their filings that the police might have planted the um, the sheath with the DNA on it. So there's a knife sheath that was found right. at the murder scene that had Brian Koberger's DNA on it on the on the on the buckle. And um, you know where have we heard that before, right? Like the the famous glove that the OJ you know, right, which is yeah. down the street um, from where we are right now, or not too far. But um, 
yeah, the police uh, police didn't plan anything on that. They would uh, when you when you take it to the next logical step, um, it means that they basically would have had to have gotten his DNA from before. For the killing, which means if they knew the killing was going to happen, they would have stopped it, or they had to commit it themselves. Yeah, like it's absurd. But, but it's a it's a really interesting thing. So his his he leaves his apartment um, right before the murder, and he takes his cell phone with him, and he doesn't turn it off until he's already on the road. So he's pinging in the direction of where the murders happened, and then he turns it back on before he comes home. So he's pinging again. You can tell the direction that a cell phone is moving because all those cell phone towers are actually they're there are three panels. If he was studying um, criminal justice and was such a crime person, why would he have ever taken his phone with him in the first place? Um, there's a great line in the movie Band of Brothers. Did you ever yeah. see that? Where they're like trying to figure out why the Germans are shooting at nothing. And mm-hmm. the one of the guys turns to his, to his uh, lieutenant and goes, because they ain't as smart as me and you. I think that's the answer. It's like the, this is his first rodeo, like we talked about. It's he is everybody is generally bad at, at at new enterprises like first time you play golf you suck at it first time you go surfing you suck at it for a lot of people when they go to commit murders for fun which is what this boils down to he he was bad at it so, so he, you don't think he so he was aware of these people in your opinion because you know going through it all did he was he obsessed with one of the girls did she reject him did they ever did she swipe on a on his face on a dating thing did he expect only two people to be home like all that and the boyfriend that was spending the night with the girl was the surprise you know that came forward what are your thoughts so i i think that what happened if i had to guess he's obsessed over one um for reasons known really only to him um maybe that'll come out maybe there'll be some social media contact between the two she is not he he is not her cup of tea Right. Um, he's a graduate student, um, and it's actually very close, even though it's across the state line in Washington State. Yeah. Um, but we're talking about she, – she, both of the women in that room are beautiful young women. And uh, Brian Koberger is kind of a weirdo loser. Yeah. Right? And, um, you know, sorry, Brian, but he was. Um, yeah. And, I mean, that's probably the most normal-looking photo I've seen right, of the guy. Right, I agree. So yeah. he um, – I think that he went there expecting her to be alone. Um uh, she, what he found out was she was sleeping with her friend. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think he expected one person in the room. I can't imagine he didn't go over with the intent to sexually assault her. That didn't happen probably because everything went nuts when he got in there. So there's a second person there now that he wasn't expecting. Um, this is sheer blind speculation right, right. based on, everything. You know, yeah. Yeah. And I, I prosecuted enough of these guys. So I, they're very seldom, do you see a serial killer where there isn't a sexual component? to the motivation to do something like that. So I think he goes in expecting to rape and maybe murder one. There's two in the bed. She probably makes enough noise. I think the boyfriend probably came down um, to see what was going on. Wound up encountering a, a guy who's, um, you know, armed with a Marine Corps K-bar knife, which next to the Roman Gladius is probably the most vicious stabbing instrument ever invented in human history. Um, that, which is another thing like, how could you take on four people? Trust me, uh, a full grown guy who's motivated with a knife in his hand could kill four college kids. That that could happen when he's getting them. Two of them are asleep. They're young women. This, they're probably all buzzed. They're, they're they are all buzzed. Like if yeah. you look at the the video of them at the taco truck or whatever right. that place, like it's a typical Saturday night that we all had in college. And mm-hmm. They're not doing anything wrong. Right. And they're but yeah, they're all they're all buzzed. That the one downstairs that saw him has gotten a whole lot of heat for. She says that she looks out and sees him and then goes back to sleep. Um, so I think that you know it's a bunch of young. I think I can say. Well, young women, I can say without offending anybody, right? Like back in our, ta- our day, it would have been a bunch of girls Because there were the two that house. survived. There's one that saw him and then one that we've never heard from. Right. And the one that saw him, um, I think that when she was talking to police, I think that she was doing that through the filter of what she what she woke up to in the morning. And I don't think she connected that ever. I mean, it's we're still in the middle of COVID. She's a guy with a mask leaving the house. Four young women living in a college house like yeah men young young men walking out of that house in the middle of the night was probably not an unusual thing yeah. so i think she sees that thinks okay everything's quiet now goes back to sleep wakes up to helter skelter in her apartment and so i think when she was giving that interview with the police it was through the shock of but her now saying, they're My saying God. that no now there is some text proving that they were awake that was the latest thing i saw that that she was awake 
or that they were awake when, that he, when he got inside the house. They were somehow texting each other about like, did you hear that? That's weird. Oh, something. I'd be curious to see those. But I also think, you know, it could have been something where they just are like, what was that? You hear like a boom, like shut up, you know, yeah, and then it's right. silence because they're dead. And then you're like, well, is is the girl fighting with her boyfriend or all right, whatever. Right. I don't want to get involved. Right. And then did you hear that? No, I didn't. Or something like that. Yeah. And then the other girl that we've never heard from, I heard from like my person that she is just, was just, you know, done like so needing major mental health yeah. help, everything. Right. And I mean, imagine walking into that. Both and, of them, I'm and, sure. Yeah. yeah. Knife homicides are really ugly things. Yeah. Because it's, the, people die from what's called exsanguination. They bleed to death. That's how you, that's how you die from a knife. Right. And so, yeah, the, this scene, yeah, would have been horrific. So. Yeah, and just everybody depicting like the, the kids and how they did it. And I'm like, gosh, you know, I think that's always the biggest thing with like watching the 2020s and the Datelines is like when someone, you know, is the suspect or is the husband and it's like, well, he 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 was crying, but no tears came. He was doing this. And here's a moment where we see them chuckle. Mm -hmm. Well, like, you know, even after the worst deaths and stuff and people coming around, there's a moment where you're like, you know, you might have like a laugh, like, right. and you know, and then that gets on camera and forever, that's what they play over and right. over again. Right. Oh, yeah. obviously he did it or she did it yeah. or, you know. Yeah, that young woman downstairs has gotten um, an unfair amount of criticism, I think. I mean, and like, there's no way that either one of them even certainly didn't go back to that school. How could you ever go back to school? Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I like, mean, besides right. the worst thing in the group that could happen, your friends being murdered, you don't have a college right. life it's anymore. Life you don't yep. have, you know, anything. To yep. Yeah, and imagine that you, you're 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 the one that has to have people go. Wait, how come you didn't call the cops for the rest of her life? Yeah, you know, which is, you know, I, I mean, just and and it wouldn't have made any difference either. By the way, it wouldn't have, wouldn't have saved them because um, this was this was quick. He was in and out. Things. Went I think wrong. originally people thought she heard it, and you know, originally I thought she heard it, but she was smart enough. To just stay quiet and maybe in staying quiet, like didn't even want to turn on her phone or anything, like then she fell asleep, mm -hmm. like in staying quiet, fell asleep, then woke up and then was like, was that a dream? What happened? Mm -hmm. Then saw it, then called the guys that live next door. Mm -hmm. Then they called the cops. Yeah. I mean, they're, I think you hit the nail on the head though. They're, they're It's life altering for them and they're victims too. And yeah, this, and and I'll tell you what. When they put the pieces together on this on this guy, another thing that hasn't been released is what's on his computers. I can't wait to to hear about that because it's going to be, it's going to be a cornucopia of you know masochistic sadomasochism stuff. Uh, you, you know, God only knows, but it won't be. It, it'll be it'll be telling to the mental state and of Brian Koberger. I, I'm sure the computers are always. Especially you get a, a couple of good friends with people on it. They can always find whatever sick stuff he was into. It's going to be on his computer. Yeah. And he wasn't smart enough. Like the, the guy took his freaking cell phone with him. Like, <laughs> I mean, it's it's it laughably stupid. Do you think the dad knew? Which which dad? His dad. Remember oh, they were driving yeah, together? Yeah, you know, I don't, I don't think so. And, I don't and, think and, so either. And here's another fascinating thing about serial killers and that a lot of people don't know. Like we, all, we always think of Buffalo Bill and Silence of the Lambs and, you know, somebody that's horribly abused. Vast majority of serial killers are spoiled as kids. And they, they like Jeffrey Dahmer came from a, an intact home. He had a pretty good relationship with his dad. They kind of fudged that a little bit, I think, in the, in the documentary because almost trying to make it fit. Mm -hmm. Um Rodney Alcala, the case I did, the dating game killer. Um, and uh, Anna Kendrick is coming out with a movie on that that I got to help out on, um, oh. which is awesome. What's I don't know that if, I don't know that if I'm about? supposed to say What's that, that yet. What's that crime about? It's on, uh, he was a serial killer in the 70s. And then I wound up prosecuting him in, uh, after he got reversed for the second time. And then we got a whole bunch of DNA hits to a bunch of uh, murders in LA. But he was, he had a genius level IQ. Um, had a loving home, had successful brothers and sisters. His brother came back a war hero from Vietnam, went to West Point. Um, Wait, so in the 70s he killed? In the 70s, yeah. In, in, in where? What city? LA. LA and, and Orange who, County. And who was he killing there? Um, he was, I mean, a lot of these guys go towards prostitutes. Mm -hmm. He was following really nice women home from bars. Um, all of them, every 
every victim he had was like a was a legit like one was a pediatric cancer nurse killed her in uh, Georgia Wickstead up in Malibu. And um, would he like just as they're getting out of their car, walking to their door, or no, how would he, he do he, it? He would break in. He would fall into their to their apartments okay. and then cut screen doors, and he'd do it do it in summer. He was it was the same time that, the same night, or he'd know where they lived and then come back another day. We think the same night, but okay. probably a little bit of that too. He'd meet him out in bars, follow him home, and so he. Was, and would they think he was normal when he met him in bars? Yeah, like yeah. Well, he was he was a handsome like he had the look of the seventies, and he was he had a genius level IQ. He graduated from UCLA, went to and went to NYU Film School. Um, it's it's a it is quite a story. And then and how we, would he appeared, kill them? With appeared a- on, he appeared on the dating game in the middle of his spree. Oh, this is the dating yeah, yeah, yeah. game killer? Dating game killer. Okay, and then did he, um, like, how would he do it? St- like, strangle or? He would rape them to death in every way. He would use, um, and then he would uh, strangle them, uh, bludgeon them, some of them. The, one, he murdered with a hammer after raping her with a hammer. Imagine that. And he was brutally sadistic. And he came from, a, he went to Cantwell High School. That was in our, our little world of, Catholic private mm-hmm. prep schools. Um, yearbook committee got a, a varsity letter in, in cross country. And so um, then wait, then he was got away with it for how long? Well, uh, so he murdered um, he murdered a, a girl named Robin Samso in 1979. She was 12. Um, and Oh, so then he started doing kids? No, yeah, yeah. He was equal opportunity. He, he raped and, and attempted to murder a girl named Tally Shapiro who was eight years old in 1968. Goes back to the East Coast, um, f- get, gets away. Like cops broke his door down and it was like save dying little girl, catch bad guy. And they saved the girl. He got to New York. Oh, they, they went in while it was happening? Yeah. There was a good Samaritan called it in. It's, a, it's an amazing story. Wait, s- tell the story. Okay. So he is living in Hollywood, graduated from UCLA film school, um, picks up an eight-year-old. After he's already killed regular No, he hasn't age. killed anybody yet that we know of. Um, but this is as he's getting started. This is 1968. Oh, okay. So he, um, she's walking to school. She's eight back in the days when parents would let eight-year-olds walk to school. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, gets her into his car. A good Samaritan sees this, drives her instead of the school to his house, walks her into his little bungalow in Hollywood. Um, the good Samaritan finds a payphone, calls police. The cop who shows up, um, last name is Camacho, he's a freaking hero, was shot in Vietnam and shot during the Watts riots. His first day back at work, he gets this call for a welfare check, knocks on the door. I'll call, it's like, hey, I'm just getting out of the shower. He gives it like two seconds, kicks the door in, finds this little girl who's been raped with, um, raped brutally, uh, and there's a, a barbell on her neck, and she is dying. She was in a coma for 32 days, and he gives, and naked bad guy goes running out of the house, and he renders a life-saving aid to the little girl, saves her life, but I'll call it got away, gets to New York, gets somehow gets accepted to the NYU film school, really wanted to be, really wanted to be a photographer, um, uh, uses a fake name, and he's on the t- FBI 10 most wanted list. Because to, they know who he is because he owned the house or whatever, or lived well, in the yeah, house. Yeah, he left all his ID. Okay, and, okay. and also inside the house were thousands of photographs of, of young women, young boys, and girls in you know, in the woods, in in rooms with him, like and like nobody knows what happened to any of them. He he killed a hundred people, um, at least. So yeah, because especially back then it was like so. Oh much yeah, harder. and yeah. no DNA, and, and he's also the way he was doing. He's disposing of bodies in in so ravines. So then, and stuff. okay, so then he goes to New York for a while, and he's working. Get this at an at an all girls summer summer camp oh, in wow. Vermont. And two of the little campers are get caught in a rainstorm, duck into the post office, and they're waiting for the rain to pass. And they see Mr. Berger, his alias was John Berger. Mr. Berger's on the FBI 10 most wanted list. And they're like, uh, maybe we should tell somebody. They extradite him back to LA. Um, and this but is- But he didn't kill anybody at the camp. Uh, he didn't kill anybody at the camp, but he killed at least three people that we know of- uh, In New York? In New York and in Vermont areas. Yeah, at least three, um, certainly more. But, but he eventually was convicted- of at least two murders during that time. Okay, so um, then he comes back to LA. Comes back to LA. So this is a guy who has kidnapped, raped, and attempted to murder an eight-year-old, and he get, gets a life sentence, but the, the DA gave it away for a simple child molest. But back then it was what's called indeterminate sentencing, which is an outrageous prosecutorial decision. Um, I hope the person who made it is because they alive didn't know, and listening. They didn't, they didn't know that he killed anyone in New York. Because they sucked, they sucked. You, you, as a so prosecutor, they let him off. They and they, they and then the 
the parole board, board of prison terms, released him with a life sentence. They released him after 34 months in custody. Imagine out that. into LA again. Out into LA again. And, and that's, that's where, when he gets on the dating get, game? That's where he started killing everybody. That's where he killed all of our known victims. So we had- While getting on the dating game. In the middle of his spree, he was on the dating game. He was given permission to travel cross country in his car. Um, and he killed uh, four in Los Angeles that we convicted him of. And then one in Orange County. He was suspected of, I think, four or five on the East Coast. He was convicted of two. He did one in Marin County that was cleared to him. Um, yeah, he, he and then on when a spree. and you were how, wait, how did you work on this? So, case? so he was convicted and sentenced to death in 1979. Rose Bird with the old Bird Supreme Court in California, and she was an anti-death penalty zealot essentially who mm -hmm. um, would reverse every death penalty case she got. So okay. she reversed it. He gets tried again. I got him. Tom Goldfuss was the prosecutor second time. He's now an appellate court justice. Really smart, really good prosecutor. Convicts him again, gets another death penalty, goes through the California Supreme Court, then winds up in front of the Ninth Circuit, and he gets reversed again, and it lands on my desk in 2004 for its third retrial. And that was before we had any of the DNA hits in LA. And it's, it was interesting reading, like, you know, some of the the opinion on that. It was almost almost as if- the, How old is, is he? Did he die? Yeah, he just passed away a couple of years ago on death row of dementia, of all things. Yeah. Yeah, it's an amazing story, and it's a cautionary tale to kind of some of the stuff. And we're so then now. you had, so then you worked on it. You had to go through all that stuff, right? So I teamed <gasps> up with a with a DA named Gina Satriano, who I loved to death, uh, and we we had that case for probably seven years. And then he wound up representing himself at trial because he's a psychopath, just like Ted Bundy. Right? They all loved to, to represent themselves. So I had to like to deal with this guy, and it was fascinating. He'd come in because he's he's got he's a genius, a certifiable genius. Super charming, super manipulative, and he's representing himself. And you know, if one juror buys into it, we lose. And uh, we got to, got to try in front of this fantastic judge named Francisco Bersenio, who is awesome. That was one of the, that was that, that's one of the stories in the book. Is the whole awesome? Thing. Yeah. Yep. Um, all right, we're gonna end soon. But what is going on with the uh, the beach serial killer? Yeah. So this Rex is. Huerman. Huerman. Yeah. So another kind of another fascinating example of serial killers. So this guy is, you know, that 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 image that we have that they're somehow abused, like what could make them do it? And the reality is a lot of these guys are born more than they're made. And Alcala was not abused by anybody. This guy also, um, he is he had his own architecture firm in Midtown Manhattan. Um, he had a, a family. He lived in a nice area of uh, Long Island. And um, he is suspected of 18 different murders. They've charged him right now with three. And these women were bound up in these burlap sacks. And when I, I will be really interested to see if you're from, you know, the show Dexter, yeah. where he was like, he would gown up and make sure that no DNA was right. Ever, he was doing, he had to be doing something similar to that because all these bodies were wrapped in burlap, which is a, a unique signature, but there's no DNA, no nuclear DNA. Um, so there's two kinds of DNA. There's nuclear DNA and there's mitochondrial DNA. Do you think that Dexter, the show, may have given people ideas? Um, maybe, maybe. There's a, there's a great scene in The Departed, too, where Mark Wahlberg at the end murders uh, uh, the corrupt cop that was Matt Damon, right? And he's wearing, like, he's all gloved up and he's got a, he's got a hair mask or hair, yeah. hair thing on. Um, so you see that now in, in well-written stuff. I don't know. I mean, I, I think that, this guy somehow managed not to pass on DNA, and that's fascinating. Um, yeah, and, and I they mean, got him with hairs. And I mean, so. there were stories done on this, that, you know. And yes, all these girls were sex workers. That a yep. lot of them were called up, and there was one where dropped off and running, and yep. like there was weren't there like one or two that survived it. Or well, there was survived one, him? Or? There was one that, yes, but there was one in particular that burned him. They did what's called a John roll, where he she, she took his money but didn't provide the services, like had her boyfriend come in and feign. And the night before she was murdered, it was that's the witness who saw the, uh, the his car or a car that was matched the description of his car. And he said that, you know, hey, that wasn't a nice thing to do. And then she disappeared the next night. And um so, and, and she was found. Um, so, so wait, she met him as a John. And then ripped him off. Didn't have sex with him. Didn't have sex with him. And then the next. And then she disappeared. I think it was the very next night. So so, you, so he found her wherever she was, not yeah. necessarily at his house. Yeah. But what's, what's 
every good case is a collage of evidence. Like you never want to just rely on DNA or, or just one thing. You always want cross corroborating information. So mito the DNA that they got on this guy is we're from hairs and hair instead of like, so you've got nuclear DNA or you've got mitochondrial DNA. Nuclear DNA is where we get that like one in eight octillion numbers, right? Like that's, they'll, 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 you'll hit on every genetic marker. So that's where you come up with these super crazy numbers. The numbers on this are gonna be like one in a hundred because it's mitochondrial or mito as they call it. So it's gonna be that, I don't know if you, if, if you remember the So that's the clip, not as good, obviously. It's not as good. Yeah. So his defense lawyer was out on the courthouse steps going no competent, you know, professional is going to say that this is my guy, which is a little bit of a play on words because no matter how, what the numbers are, mathematically, the term of art is they cannot be eliminated. That's what the forensic, that's what the forensic scientists will say. You, you, we cannot eliminate him, even if it's the frequencies like one in eight oct octillion or made up, you know, numbers. So what's fascinating about the human case is that they're going to have to overlap the cell phone stuff because this guy was so sadistic he wasn't done just with them. He would actually take some of the victim's cell phones and taunt their family members. So one of these victims got phone calls from the killer of her sister um, saying, you know, uh, essentially mocking her and taunting her. And But the cell phone, he was doing that as he was on the road. So that cell phone was pinging to towers along with his burner phone that he was using for like dating apps and stuff. And uh, also his personal cell. So they are they are relaying off the same towers back and forth from his home to Midtown Manhattan, which is even more convincing than the DNA, I think. And this is just like a crazy thing. But I saw this like on a TikTok where it was years ago, and Howard Stern and Robin were like talking about the ca this case and who this killer might be. And he's like, "Watch, he's going to be an architect or something." Did he really? Yes. <laughs> That's, I mean, it was just a lucky guess, it was obviously, a lucky guess. but it's like kind of crazy when you actually, because I predict things all the time and lots of times my stuff comes true, never to that effect. But I was like, wow, that's pretty on the nose. Right, you know, but if you think it. about it, Howard Stern, it, it, whether you like him or hate him, he's a super intelligent guy. Right, and he was like this, basically what he was saying is this guy is going to be someone who's walking among us that's like has his shit together and that type of thing, not... Some weird guy from the woods, you know. That and that's yeah. what's fascinating about true serial killers is right. that they they can they can be in front of you in line at Starbucks and you would never know in a million years. And that's how they get women to get into their cars. That's how they're able to lure people into positions of vulnerability. And they're almost all smart, and they've and almost all are, in my experience, they tend to be spoiled as kids. It's really interesting, not abused, but spoiled. And so wow. it's it's a bizarre sense of entitlement and. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. The I think we're going to see more and more of these uh, as we tack society-wise towards stuff like no bail and you know all that uh, sort of soft on crime business that we're seeing in our beloved city of Los Angeles. Yeah, that doesn't end well. And I think we're going to we're, we're going to see more Rex Hurmans, more Go Go Beach guys as things go forward. Because had Alcala in in the modern era kidna kidnapping an eight year old girl and and almost killing her. That guy never should have been released. And the of fact course, that he was yeah. cost the lives of probably 100 people. And I, I just, I worry because it's been so long since we had like the reign of the serial killers in LA because the, the Hillside Strangler, An Angela Bono, um, uh, Skid Row, Slasher, we had a, all of these guys were active at the exact same time in the late 70s and early 80s. And I, 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 fear, for, I fear for all of our safety that these guys will be getting out. Um, yeah. For some of them, and you, and you can't you can't fix them either. Like, of course a not. Yeah, yeah. They don't they don't get better. Medication doesn't work. You think serial there are serial killers that w that are going to get out? They don't have a life sentence. You mean one hundred percent? Yes, a absolutely. I guarantee it. I, I mean, there are there are people that are in for murder right now. Like George Gascon in Los Angeles County has prohibited his deputies from going and opposing life or release on parole. So the Los Angeles County District Attorney's Office right now. As, as a matter of course, you send a deputy to oppose dangerous murderers from getting out. Gascon has ended that in Los Angeles County. So if, if it's a murder committed by somebody when they were 18 and they've got, they got all the juice in them and they're, they've got, they're one of these guys, and if they're paroled because it is not opposed by the sitting district attorney of Los Angeles and they get out, they will absolutely kill again, no doubt. Like 
little gangster who does it back in the day. You know, I think a lot of them, the juice is out of them. By the time they're 45, they just want to sit on their couch and watch a Laker game. Like they're not, a lot of them aren't dangerous. You know? Right. And I, I, there are, I, that was part of my job for years. I'd go to, I've been to every prison in California that has lifers. And some of them, um, you actually, you know, they really don't pose a danger, you know, depending on the circumstances. But these guys, the, they will until, until they stop drawing breath. Like the serial killers, the psychopaths, those guys, if they're in for murder number one and we're only prevented from murders two through 25 because they're in prison, when they are out, they will reoffend. Pick up again. Yeah, 100%. Whew. Yeah. Well, lock, lock your doors. So, <laughs> not, not to end on a downer. I'll try to but. vote correctly. Um, so, do you have any um, 2020 stuff or anything coming up? Yes. So, okay. I got. Uh, I got a, I got so much stuff I'm excited about. Uh, a, qu a quick funny story. I'm in. I, they're letting me do a bunch of stuff with News Nation, which mm -hmm. is a new up and coming. Um, and I've gotten to be friends with a couple of their couple of their their hosts. Uh, one of them is Elizabeth Vargas. Yeah, yeah. Who and she's awesome. By the way, she is she is she is a phenomenal person. Um, I, I like her whole history is interesting, and but she's so she's been really nice to me and giving me a bunch of live spots. On her show, and live TV is a different ballgame. Like, I don't know what camera to look at, and it, yeah. it feels a little bit like a closing argument. And so, last week, I'm in New York City, and I've just done her show, and we were talking about, um, uh, I think we were talking about that Armstrong case, the um, the the little runner, if I'm not mistaken. And anyway, I'm, I'm at the elevators, and uh, do you know who Ashley Banfield wait, is? Wait, who's our, wait, which little runner? What, the, which the, 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 Caitlin Armstrong. Oh, Caitlin yeah. Armstrong. Yeah, yeah. Okay, sorry. And then we who'd you ask me? One. Yeah. And I'm 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 leaving, and yeah. the, the, you know, the production assistants walk me out, and Ashley Banfield. You know who that is? Yes. Yes. Yeah, super famous. Like used to be with NBC. Also, yeah. could not be nicer. She comes up to me at the elevator, and yeah. she's like, she's got her makeup thing around her neck, and yeah. You know, so she got up out of the chair to come over, and she's like, "Hey, I I really enjoy your interviews, which is hugely flattering to me." And yeah. she's like, "My name's Ashley. Um, I'd love it if you came on my show." It's like, Ashley, who? Like, you know. It, it, she, it's like, yeah, you're very famous. I mean, I would love to do it. So she had me on three times last week. And cool. Yeah, super fun, super fun. So uh, doing a bunch of iCrime stuff with Elizabeth Vargas for her show, uh, uh, iCrime. Uh, it's basically videos of the day. Um, and so I've gotten to do some commentary on that. I got a, I got a, just shot for a new 2020 last week. I did 14 different interviews last week in New York City for different shows and stuff, which is an absolute blast. And um, hopefully that keeps... It keeps going. Well, no one knew who you were before Juicy Scoop. So hey, good luck. I, I've got to tell you, <laughs> the people that have sort of following me, your fans are so nice. I, I, like, They're I've, the best. I've gotten the nicest comments. Um, you know, and I, it, it's it's a weird, hateful world on online media. And um, and I everybody that has followed me from your show uh, has just been really really nice so i'm i'm super grateful for now you. the real juicy scoopers are the best and honest and love the people that are on my show and are not so if you ever get some weird psycho they're not really a juicy no, scooper I, they're I, pretending to be to make me look bad yeah no yes because uh, the real juicy scoopers are great yeah so tell everybody where they can follow you though uh on matt murphy law on instagram and uh yeah and i've got uh, if anybody's interested in the book, that'll be it's it's a glacial age before it's actually going to come out. Right now, they're, they're telling me. Well, you know what's good about this? You know, you got to be strategic. Like I'm like right now, there's like three or four books out that would is in the juicy scoop world. There's Brittany coming next week. There's Julia Fox. There's Jada Pinkett Smith. I want to say there's like another one and like. I'm like, God, I would not want my book to be coming out this week. So yeah. what's good about being with a good publisher? They'll make sure that. Your book is not going to be competing with anything yeah. remotely similar. Hopefully, and that's where it's yeah. Good and and to I'm be. not I'm not complaining. They they've yeah. treated, they've treated me great, but it's just I I want to um, I'm I'm super eager. I want people to read it. Well, so. what I think would be is great is and um, especially your story. Like it could totally be a movie. It could be a series. It could be whatever. So I think that's why there's no rush. That's what's always so great about a book. It's like the it's the ultimate calling card. Like even if something doesn't happen, even if it's a hit and nothing happens for, and you're like, oh, I guess all those meetings, nothing happened. You don't know that in like five years, 10 years, all of a sudden, you know, and that's what's so great yeah. about it. Yeah. And Putting all the time and effort into it. It's like you have this piece of property, just like a, like, just like a piece of real estate that can be sold later on. Yeah. Plus it's just, for me, it's been it's been fascinating to write it, like just going back. And I kept journals. 
Oh, all oh this. wow, so that's I'm, great. I'm, I'm going through reading old journal entries, and it's mostly that's like stony thoughts in my head, like, you know, I should probably be committed after people actually read what I wrote, but it's like watching an autopsy, the stuff that would go through my head, you know? Um, so I think I, hopefully people will like it. Yeah, they it's, will. It's, it's, it's more personal than I originally set out for it to be, so. I think it's uh, great. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully. Matt Murphy, what's your Insta? Uh, Matt Murphy Law. Great. Matt Murphy Law. Thank yep. you. Thank you so much.